Thank you. Um, pleasure to be here today. Uh, welcome everyone to this wonderful, fabulous workshop around environmental social governance. I always feel like there needs to be a word after that, like environmental social governance, what? Reporting, you know? So we're gonna get into that um, as we go through the day. Um, my name's Sarah Healy, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Riverine Plains. Hopefully most of you are familiar with that organisation. Um, we operate a large footprint um, from southern New South Wales, so as high up as Wagga, right down to around Benalla, across to the beautiful Alpine Mountains, and Shepparton's probably the farthest uh, west. East? West. We go. So um, that's a little bit about Riv Plains, but today we're all about cutting through. Um, if you've turned up today, you probably, hopefully, know what ESG stands for and you're probably a little way down that journey. So you've moved past, okay, I think that's about data, um, but now what do I do with it? And the presenters today are definitely um, looking at what valuable things they can pass on to you about the various environments they're operating where ESGs are playing out um, and what you can take away and use. But we're all about cutting through. There's a lot going on out there at the moment. In fact, I reckon in the last 12 months, it's gone from a low hum of, uh, let's talk about carbon, how do we capture it, to biodiversity, to reporting, legislation, frameworks, and it's almost at fever pitch. Um, and so I reckon now's a really good time to be going, okay, what do I need to do? What out of this? do I need to do? There's a really great quote that I picked up a few days ago from a guy called Mark Twain in uh, 1956, saying data, or ESGs, is like garbage. <laughs> you better know what you're gonna do with it before you start to collect it. And I reckon that's a really good way to think about this. Like, what am I gonna do with it? What am I gonna be reporting against? What am I gonna need to present or show credibility before you start collecting it. Um, and I think a really good example um, of where we're at on this journey, because we're probably up to our necks now into thinking about data, thinking about what's coming from overseas, particularly in agriculture, because this is cross-sector, right? Like ESGs aren't just um, focused on agriculture, but today that's what we're talking about. Um, it's, it's already arrived, but I really, when I was thinking about where we're at on this journey, something sprung to mind, and so I'm gonna ask you a question, and I'm, I'm really curious actually on the answer. Who remembers the year 2000? Who remembers the millennial bug? Yeah? Isn't it scary that not everyone here remembers that, which means that was 24 years ago. Um, my son's birthday is today, he's seven. He was born in 2017, and that feels like yesterday. Um, so it's really weird knowing there are people in the room who were too small or not even on the planet 24 years ago. So the millennial bug, um, in the six months leading up to when we changed over to the new millennium, there was a lot of crazy. <laughs> and at the time, it was generally a concern. It was genuinely a concern. There was talk about systems crashing, computers crashing, businesses falling down because they weren't ready for the change of date. You know, the data would not transfer, that the stock exchange would happen, um, would crash, and, you know, we'd spend billions on trying to transition just into the new century. And it went on for quite a while. So by the time we got to December, everyone's pretty on edge. They're pretty overwhelmed, they weren't really sure. And I reckon that's about where we are um, with ESGs and data and legislations around greenhouse gases and carbon. We're just not sure what this is gonna do. We're a bit nervous that it might have an impact on us. We're a bit nervous we're gonna lose some money on it. We might even, though, come out of it all right. And you're pretty sure you've been doing a pretty good job up until this point, so we don't want this sort of unknown thrown at, thrown at us. And that's how it was leading into the millennial, um, into the change of uh, centuries. Um, I don't know about you, but I think everyone woke up on the 1st of January 
or they never went to bed, depending on how hard you party, um, switched on their very basic phones back then, analogues, switched on the TV, free, air, free to air TV, um, and maybe even your computer, and it was business as usual. There was very little to see here. And within a few days, everyone has just gotten on. They just forgot about it. So we all remember the bug. We all remember the chaos and the potential panic, fear, uncertainty. But really, once we got through that, we just got on with it. And I reckon there's a lot of parallels with that, uh, that situation and potentially where we're going. Now, it could be wrong because we're not there yet. We're not through to the other side and it's not a discrete date change that will get us there. Um, but I think the other important thing to remember about the millennial bug is there are a lot of people in the background leading up to that change of date who were working to solve the problems before they hit. And I reckon there's a lot of people doing that now. Um, in fact, a lot of the corporates and the people who are gonna be um, ensuring that we're adhering to some of these frameworks are really, already really skilled. And we'll hear about some of those um, systems and frameworks and processes, I hate saying that, but I actually really like them, um, that are already in place. So that's gonna ease this transition and make it less scary. So like I said, I'm assuming a lot of you know what ESGs are, or environmental social governance is, ah, I don't know. Um, but if you don't, I'll do a really brief recap and I'm absolutely sure some of our presenters are gonna um, in, enlighten you further on some of these things. So ultimately, environmental social governance did start essentially in the finance sector to allow investors to manage risk, to get uh, an indication of credibility with the, the people they wanted to invest in or the companies they wanted to invest in. Um, but now it's sort of a cross-sector. It's absolutely cross-sector. Um, because it allows um, investors of any kind to assess credibility. Um, so the environmental social governance pillars have come out of that because they're not neat little boxes. But um, it's pretty fair to say that the most complex of the pillars is the environment side of things. And that's the one that's so close to us and so uh, immediate in terms of our response. Um, that's driven um, because of a change of climate and increasing levels of greenhouse gas emissions and our need to protect our planet for future generations. Um, but it's also good business sense. So if you're using less and producing more, that's a good thing. That's more good stuff left in the system for longer. So that's where it came from. It's obviously now in full fledged overseas. So Europe is well and truly down the pathway of needing for farmers to actually report against those frameworks. And that's probably where the sort of panic is coming from. Because we sell a lot of product into Europe. So if they're already assessing it, then we're going to have to prove our credibility. And there's nervousness about whether that's going to reduce our ability to trade internationally. But when we talk about the E part of ESGs, what are we actually talking about? Greenhouse gases, but not just on your farm, upstream and downstream. And I'll talk really briefly about the scope levels, scope one, two and three, which talks about that from an emissions point of view. And it looks at products from cradle to grave. So them coming uh, online and then, you know, finishing their life products. Um, and it actually looks at whether this translates to a long-term business advantage. So that's the upside because it does feel like it's a lot to be thinking about how much we're emitting um, and whether that's going to take up a lot of our energy, but actually it's a good thing that we're monitoring that because it is going to lead to efficiencies in your business and hopefully greater profitability. That's the environmental pillar. Social, the S. This is really about an organisation, a farm, a company's ethics. Are you looking after your staff? Can you prove it? Are you adhering to labour practices 
that are either legislated or required in whatever country you're producing a product. Um, are you thinking about that upstream and downstream, so about your supply chain? Um, and, can, and are you adhering to standard safety practices, work health safety or anything just for your farm or enterprise? So that's what the S stands for. Um, there's a chance over time we'll be starting to look at also in the S category of are we providing services to underprivileged, underprivileged social groups? That's a lot to bring in. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of flag that I'm giving you a really simple snapshot, but there's more um, that, uh, to these sorts of headings. That's an example. On to the G. This is the governance pillar. Um, in my mind, I feel like this is not too dissimilar to the social pillar because they basically are saying, do you have governance around these, the E and the S? Um, do you have a, a board, which is, as you know, boards are legislated. They, there are certain things that um, they need to do for the organisation. But ultimately, it's ensuring your organisational farm or enterprise is adhering to your social responsibilities or strategy. And so they want evidence of that. And things like anti-competitive practices and corruption um, fall into the governance pillar. So, super high level, basic summary of ESGs. Hope that, hope that helps for those who have like, never heard of it before. Um, and I am open to correction because I don't know if there's any expert in ESG and I never claim to be one. Um, but I think this is like, it's really useful to have um, various interpretations of what this all means. So this is mine, having worked in agriculture in this space for a number of years. Um, a quick in brief about the greenhouse gas aspect and carbon, because that's probably what you're hearing the most about. As I said, this is the most immediate one for farmers to consider. They look at three levels, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Easy one to remember is scope one is direct, what you do on your farm, what greenhouse gases you're emitting and how you're recording it. We have a pretty sophisticated accounting system in Australia already. My sense is we will default to one. Um, there's a couple of other, um, there's, there's the official frameworks, but there are other tools out there that use slightly different approaches. I think we'll see that default just to one, one Australian standard, and that's good news. Um, but scope one, scope two, and scope three is an internationally set um, uh, set of measures. So scope one, direct. Scope two, um, think upstream. What are the greenhouse gas emissions on the things that I'm bringing onto my farm to use? And they have to be accounted for. Good news is a lot of the work's being done on that, so you don't have to work too hard to know how much greenhouse gas is emitted when you get in a certain amount of ammonia or not um, fertiliser. So most of that work's being done. It's a simple task of putting it in to your spreadsheet. I'll talk about it in a sec. Scope two, um, indirect. Oh, sorry, we've done that. Scope three is um, downstream. Um, again, indirect emissions. What happens after your product leaves the farm gate? Where does it go? What's associated with that? So, <clears throat> when we're talking about E, we're talking about emissions, um, we're talking about the thing that's really hitting us in the face right now, the Y2K bug. Those scopes are important, but then you need to start measuring. But think about the Mark Twain quote. <laughs> Before you start collecting, know what you're doing it for. So, um, we're going to start the day with my three points. Like I said, I'm going to circle back to these at the end of the day to check in on how I went in terms of what the presenters say. Um, my view, working in agriculture for 25 years and in the ag tech and digital ag space for the last mm, nearly 10, I reckon if you're good at managing your business as a farmer or an agribusiness and you're making money, you're probably already collecting enough data that you'll need to complete this reporting and demonstrate you're adhering to these principles. That's my sense. Because if you're making money in farming, you're doing something right. 
and you're probably doing it sustainably because you want to hand on your farm to the next generation in a good way. So I'm confident we've got this sorted. My view also is, believe it or not, the simplest way to start collecting data is with a spreadsheet. The good thing about spreadsheets, they're simple, they're transferable, and if you do a simple Google of what sorts of things you're likely to be measured um, for in, ES, in an ESG environment, you'll be able to pick off the sorts of fields you'll need to start filling in. <coughs> Any platform that comes online or that a corporate wants you to start engaging with, with data, should talk to a spreadsheet. So it's a good place to start. Now, it could be wrong. By the end of the day, I might come back and go, oh, actually. Um, but the other thing is, I think a lot of farmers are worried they're going to be taken for a ride. They're going to be sold a data platform that's not secure and that might fall short of claims. Um, they're worried they might get sold into a carbon market um, that they don't know enough about to be confident. Um, and I would say, fear not, it's a bit like the millennial bugs. There are people in the background working. The corporates, the people who really need this information are building systems and they're gonna come to you um, and they're gonna help you navigate those systems. Um, so it's not all on a landholder or a farmer to figure out this crazy stuff that's going on. You will get help and there are people who really know this stuff who are gonna help you. <clears throat> so to finish with and to introduce our first speaker, um, my view is the best thing you can do right now is just be more efficient. Um, do more for less and not worry too much about do I put in something that's going to give me more biodiversity credits or fix high levels of carbon and get too fancy. Just work on the system that you've got and make it better, more efficient and more sustainable. And that's all we need to do right now. And then we can start monitoring that data and you'll likely be rewarded if you get that system even more efficient.